Good morning, everyone. Um, it was the last week of class. Uh, so how are you all feeling end of semester? Lots of assignments left, or is it all a lot left? <laughs> yes, a lot left. <laughs> OK. So uh, yeah, we have to finish our content today. So we'll also try and go quickly through the last few we have from chapter 10 to chapter 13, so four chapters to cover today. We'll go a little quickly through it. Um, and then um, we've I've posted the final quiz on Google Classroom on the e-learning platform as well. So uh, for all of you online, yeah, you all can access it and complete it anytime. Um, and yeah, your final paper, all of that as well. Uh, if you haven't yet submitted it, uh, please make sure you submit it before the deadline. Okay, uh, before we begin, would someone open us in prayer, please? Okay. Let's Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you kept us safe and healthy uh, throughout the semester and as we are in the uh, last session, God, we just pray that even today, you will help us to remember everything that we learned and everything that we are going to learn, God. Uh, help us to open our mind and heart and listen to truth in our hearts so that we can be a light that shines for your kingdom, God. We give uh, Smith and Mamma your hands. We bless her in the name of Jesus. And I give all my classmates into your hands that they be good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. OK, so we'll continue where we stopped last week, which is uh, chapter 10, verses 4 onwards. Um, I'll just read those three verses, and then we'll go from there. Uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Uh, so here, Paul, um, just before this, has been talking about uh, how some people were talking about him being uh, timid in person but bold uh, in his letters. So uh, there was uh, there were some people who were saying when he's away from us, then he is very bold and he writes boldly. But then when he's in person with us, then uh, we see that he's very timid. And so he um, is here talking about the fact that they are not waging war uh, in fleshly ways, right? So they're not trying to scare the people by trying uh, by using their authority or uh, using human methods for bringing people to submission. Uh, instead, they uh, depend on God and they fight with spiritual weapons to bring down any uh, anything that's coming against Christ Himself. Um, so uh, this is so he's saying that this is how we're going to fight uh, the battles that are coming up. And mostly in these last few chapters, he's addressing uh, the opponents uh, who are talking against him, who are speaking against him. And so in the, it's in regard to this that he's saying we won't fight according to the flesh. So these people are boasting in uh, fleshly things. And we are not going to reciprocate in the same way. Rather, we are going to uh, use spiritual weapons. Um, so we look a little bit at uh, what it means to uh, what you can do with spiritual weapons and what are some of the spiritual weapons that are available to us. Uh, so this is all in your notes. Uh, your spiritual weapons will pull down strongholds, cast down arguments, uh, break down anything that exalts itself. So uh, against the knowledge of God. So anything that is uh, not in line with 
what God says, right? So anything that is coming against what God says and is trying to uh, lift itself up over the thoughts of God, the ways of God, uh, those things uh, will be toned down with the spiritual weapons that we use. And then every thought being brought captive to uh, obedience to Christ. Um, so we look at it in this progression that uh, from a thought, it becomes a reason or an argument. From a reason or argument, it becomes an imagination. And from imagination, it becomes a stronghold. Uh, looking at James 1.14, it says, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Um, so starting with when temptation comes to us, it starts with a wrong thought or a desire that we have. Uh, so the temptation uh, comes in that way. It um, it uh, brings that wrong thought or it brings something uh, to us. And then how we respond will determine whether that becomes uh, a stronghold in our lives. Uh, so if we entertain that thought and we allow ourselves to start reasoning it out and uh, explaining away why it's OK to engage in that, or uh, we try to, uh, we allow those thoughts to linger in our head, even though we know that they're wrong thoughts, whether it be um, thoughts of anger, thoughts of bitterness, thoughts of negativity towards something or someone, or lust, whatever those thoughts are, whatever we are entertaining, uh, will start to become things that we allow to linger in our minds. So they become a way we reason away things, or uh, they uh, become an argument that we can have. And that leads to uh, imagination. So we start to imagine things based on uh, what we are thinking. Uh, so we imagine, um, we imagine whatever we are. Uh, if if it's a lustful thought, then we imagine things in line with that. Or if it's a negative thought, we start to imagine uh, negative ha things happening to us, negative things happening to others. Uh, if it's bitterness or anger, then we start to imagine harm towards other people. Uh, so that kind of imagination then becomes a stronghold that uh, that really takes a, a place of uh, kind of control in our minds and in our lives. And so it is only with spiritual weapons that these things can be toned down. Uh, and some of the spiritual weapons we have is the word of God, the name of Jesus. So each of these has a Bible verse connected to it. We won't read all of these verses, uh, but I'll just name the, uh, the weapons. So God's word, uh, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and praise and worship. These are the weapons with which we can fight against strongholds. So if we recognize that there are strongholds in our lives, uh, we use the word of God. We use the name of Jesus. We uh, pray by the blood of Jesus the victory that is ours because uh, Jesus' blood was shed for us. Uh, we... Uh, we receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring freedom into our lives. And we worship and praise God, giving him uh, the place of authority and acknowledging his, uh, his glory, who he is, uh, in the midst of whatever we are wanting to deal with. And in uh, by using those spiritual weapons, we will start to see those strongholds break down. And, um, we will see freedom from the things that have so far controlled our lives. Uh, so this is for a personal application of this. And Paul is saying, uh, these are we use spiritual weapons even as we engage with our opponents. So when people are coming against us, they are boasting in themselves. They are boasting in their own authority or their uh, skills or they're boasting in the flesh, basically. So we are not going to respond in the same way. Uh, we are not going to fight in the flesh. Rather, we are going to use spiritual weapons to uh, overpower them and to bring them down. Um, so we'll go on from there. Can someone read verses 7 to 11 for us, please? Uh, 
chapter 10, verses 7 to 11. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses uh, 7 to 11. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is conceived in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself. That just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast some word more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for destruction, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech con contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such we will also be in deed when we are present. Sorry. So uh, this is just a continuation of that, uh, what Paul has been saying, um, that uh, if you think, uh, so one thing is, are you looking at outward appearance, right? So uh, when they are making these judgments about Paul, uh, what are they judging based on? Are they looking at uh, spiritual things? Are they looking at whether uh, he truly has proved to be uh, a minister by the way he has served? Or are they looking at these uh, outward things? And from what he is saying, it seems to be that everything they are judging by is only outward appearance. Uh, and so uh, he says, uh, this whole part that follows as well, he says, look, uh, if you think that you are in Christ, then we are just as much in Christ as you are. Um, and even if we boast in the authority that God has given us, uh, this authority is to build you up. It's not to destroy you. So that is something uh, even as leaders uh, that we recognize that authority is given to us by God to be people who build up the body of Christ, um, who build up his people. We don't use our authority to tear down to people, to take control over people, to um, establish our own authority. That's uh, that's not the uh, reason God gives us that responsibility. Rather, it is uh, to equip, to edify, to build up people, to be fully uh, what God has called them to be. Um, and then um, he, he tells them, uh, if you are uh, thinking that we are not going to do whatever we've said in our letters, or we are going to be bold in our letters, but in person we are going to be weak, uh, be prepared that when we come in person, we are going to be just the same as we were in our letters. So to prepare them that uh, he is going to still bring up and address the things that were talked about in the letter, uh, that he will not uh, be, um, be weak in person, but only talk or correct or rebuke them in, the, in his letters. Um, we can go on. Verses 12 to 17, if someone can read that for us. This is 12 to 17. For we dare not last ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves or not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which ex especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came uh, with the gospel of Christ. Until verse, uh, yeah, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is in other men's labor, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he who condemns him, commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Uh, 
so a continued discussion about his opponents and how they are boasting right so they are boasting in their own um, accomplishments but they are also uh, coming to the extent where they are uh, they are operating in Paul's field, right? So Paul uh, had been the one who planted the Corinthian church, but they've come into Paul's area of work and they've started to uh, boast about themselves in this place. Um, so one thing that Paul brings up is they are comparing themselves among themselves. Uh, this is not the way we uh, we should seek to um, to boast or a place in which we should find pride because when we're comparing ourselves with other human beings uh, we are using human standards fleshly standards and worldly standards uh, rather we will always look at the standards of god the standards of christ and we uh, if we are comparing ourselves by those standards we will uh, walk in humility there is no place for boasting right because we recognize our own weakness our own lack our own need for uh, the grace of god for the holy spirit to meet god's standards uh, and uh, so these people were boasting because they were comparing themselves with one another and uh, that was how they were finding things to boast in uh, the other thing that paul talks about is they are boasting in a area uh, that is not theirs, right? So Paul is saying, if you're boasting, you boast where you have been given authority by God. So I worked among you, Corinthians. And so if I boast, I'll boast about the work that God has done through me in your midst. Uh, but I will not boast uh, about anything that is beyond the work that I have done. So I won't boast in someone else's work, in another church which somebody else planted like the opponents are doing um and uh, paul again affirms here that our goal is for you to grow in faith because as you grow in faith and maturity then we can move our work beyond you to new areas uh we can reach out to new regions and we can uh increase our influence uh and the work that we've done to go beyond you and wherever we are boasting it will only be about where we have worked where god has used us and our boasting will only be in the lord so he says uh he quotes from jeremiah 9 um, i'll just read that verses 23 and 24 this is what the lord says let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches but let the one who boasts boasts about this that they have the understanding to know me that i am the lord who exercises kindness justice and righteousness on earth for in these i delight declares the lord um so uh, from Jeremiah 9, it's saying, don't boast in your own wisdom, strength, or riches, but boast in the fact that God has enabled you to know him, right? And uh, Paul uses that here, and he says, if we boast, we will only boast in the Lord. So we'll only boast in what the Lord has entrusted to us and what he has enabled us to do. Uh, we will not boast in our own strength or in anything that is human or fleshly. So these are the ways in which Paul is responding. And when he talks about using spiritual weapons, these are the spiritual weapons he's using, right? So he's saying, I will boast in the Lord. Uh, I will not boast in work that I have not done. Um, I will uh, not boast in the flesh, right? I will not uh, I will not compare myself by human standards. I will only, uh, I, I won't compare myself to other humans. Right? So all of those things, he's not following the ways of the world. He's not fighting uh, these battles in the flesh as his opponents are. So let's go on from there to chapter 11. Um, if someone can read verses 1 to 4. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. On that, oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. 
for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> Paul is continuing here uh, to uh, address uh, issues that he's concerned with. So he's not concerned with the fact that other people are coming in and ministering to the Corinthians, right? Because we know that after he left, he himself sent people, he sent Timothy, he sent Titus, but also Apollos went to the Corinthian church. Uh, and minister to them. So it's not that he is jealous about other ministers uh, being invited or being welcomed by the church. That is not the not his concern. His concern is that these the his uh, opponents are people who are leading the congregation away from Christ. So that is the main issue. It's not about Paul's authority. It's not about uh, him losing his position in the church. Uh, it is about them remaining faithful to Christ, the church remaining faithful to Christ. Um, and so um, he he starts here um, that if asking if they will bear with him. And he'll go into uh, a lot of uh, different things, different ways in which he will uh, defend the ministry that they've done and talk about what they have accomplished. Uh, but verse 2, he talks about the, his jealousy. So he differentiates between a jealousy that is human and fleshly versus a godly jealousy, right? God himself calls uh, he says i am a jealous god and so um this is the kind of jealousy paul has for them where he wants them to be faithful to christ um and he says i have betrothed you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin so we see in the old testament when the covenant was given uh, to the hebrews that was viewed as uh, like a marriage covenant. So we see a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament talking about uh, uh, talking about the Israelites as people who had uh, prostituted themselves, people who had abandoned God. Uh, so that was the view that when we enter into covenant with God, uh, it is like a marriage covenant that we are betrothing ourselves um, to God as um, as his bride. Right. Uh, and so Paul is using that same imagery from the Old Testament and saying, now we are part of this new covenant with God. And just like in the old covenant, the, the people of Israel um, were betrothed to God. You, as part of the new covenant, are betrothed to God. Um, and Paul is talking about himself uh, almost um, as a father to the church. So we uh, see this in First Corinthians four fifteen as well, where he says, "You have many spiritual, you um, have many leaders, but you don't have many spiritual fathers." And uh, he talks about the fact that he himself was a spiritual father to the church, um, and so the position of a father would be to uh, give their give their child in marriage to someone and to guard their child's purity, sexual purity until uh, until the time of marriage. And so this is the role that uh, Paul sees as his responsibility over the church, that he will present the church as a pure bride uh, for Christ. Um, and then uh, he says, uh, in verse 3, I fear that you may be deceived as Eve was deceived. Um, so also you may be deceived by these, uh, by the uh, the opponents who are coming in, these other leaders who are coming in. Uh, and so he's here, from here on, he's uh, almost saying that these people are sent by Satan. Because the serpent, uh, we know in the Garden of Eden, uh, was... Um, Satan tempting Eve, right? And so even these opponents who are coming in are uh, operating under Satan's authority, are coming in uh, to break up the church, to lead them astray, to lead them away from Christ. 
so it's not a small issue that Paul is dealing with. It's not uh, just uh, another leader, another person whom people are following. It's someone who is uh, bringing deception, who's leading them astray, who's taking them away from the true gospel, taking them away from Christ. It is a big issue, which is why Paul is really like, he's not shying away from dealing with it. He's not simply trying to defend his authority. He's trying to protect the work that has been done. He's trying to protect the people uh, in the church from falling away from their faith. And he's trying to protect the church itself uh, for Christ. Uh, so we recognize the gravity of the situation when we're reading this. Um, so the last uh, verse we see, 4, verse 4, uh, so some of the things he says, if someone preaches another Jesus, if they uh, are giving you a different spirit, a different gospel, uh, you may you may receive it. So uh, the fact is that these people are um, are not are not watching. They're not staying on guard. And they are being uh, carried away by people who are charismatic, people who are impressive in their speaking, uh, people who uh, are boasting and convincing them that whatever they are saying is true. Right? It's very easy to get carried away by people who are charismatic, uh, who um, who seem very confident. Uh, and that seems to be the culture we are in as well. The people who go into leadership positions are people who are able to speak well. It's not that they have great character, that they've proved themselves. A lot of the time, it's just that they are able to speak well and people are carried away by their speech, uh, which is similar to what the Corinthians uh, were, uh, we're seeing in the Corinthian church as well. So we go from here to verses 5 to 15. Someone can read that for us. 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 5 to 15. For I consider that I'm not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I'm untrained in speech, yet I'm not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, churches taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Thank you. So, um, so here uh, again, Paul is continuing uh, talking about um, uh, about another issue. Uh, so uh, before this, uh, he was talking about what is the kind of message the apostles were preaching or these people who were uh, claiming to be apostles, right? His opponents. Uh, and so in this part, he is talking about one of the issues that the church and his opponents were bringing up, uh, which is the issue of uh, being financially supported by the church. Uh, like we looked at in First Corinthians, that that was something that was viewed as 
honorable where uh, they as a church would support him financially instead of him working so instead of him doing manual labor to support himself and lowering himself to the working class uh, if he was a true wise philosopher he would not choose to uh, do manual labor instead he would either uh, receive support from the church or he would beg those were the two things that philosophers did they would beg for money or they would have someone like a rich person supporting their work uh, so paul didn't choose those he chose to uh, chose to work with his hands chose to support himself and he also was receiving support from outside churches and so this was a big uh, reason why a lot of the uh, more influential people in the church were upset about his choice of work and uh, his decision to not receive their financial support um and so again he is going back to this this is being used against him by his opponents as well uh, so he uh, the first part he talks about i'm not inferior to them even if i don't have the same training in speech as they do uh, i do have knowledge and that knowledge has been clearly seen by you uh, so it's not about being impressive uh, by the way we communicate uh, it's how have we uh, revealed that we know Christ? How have we revealed that we truly uh, are growing in a knowledge of Christ? Is that being evidenced in the way we work? So uh, in in the signs and the wonders and the miracles, in uh, the in the teaching, uh, in the revelation that was coming through the teaching, all of those things were evidence that Paul knew Christ himself and that was more important than his speech right uh, and so uh, that's what he talks about in verse 6 and then on verse 7 onwards he's talking about uh, this issue of uh, financial support uh, so I'll just read a few verses from 1 Corinthians 9 as well where he talks about financial support uh, 1 Corinthians 9 15 and I have not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me, for I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? just this that in preaching the gospel i may offer it free of charge and not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel so in first corinthians 9 15, uh, 9 15 to 18 he's talking about giving up the right to receive uh, support from the church he chose not to do that uh, just so that uh, the church would not in any way see him as someone who was trying to cheat them trying to deceive them or just trying to get their money right so if money is out of the picture then what could be his reasons for bringing the gospel uh, it's uh, his motivation was truly to give the gospel to them uh, was truly for christ to be known uh, there was no other uh, side agenda, no other uh, hidden agenda that he was coming with. Uh, and so because money was not in the picture, uh, they didn't have to have those kinds of questions or doubts when he took the gospel to them. Uh, the other thing is, if he was being supported by them, he would again be dependent on them and would um, this was called like a patron client relationship where he would be their client. Uh, that would also uh, sometimes skew uh, a willingness to say correct them, to challenge them because he is dependent on them financially. So uh, those were decisions that Paul made. And we see throughout these two, first and second Corinthians, how Paul dealt with money with such great wisdom, right? So uh, here, because he was not dependent on them, he never had to make decisions based on my support is coming from them. So can I say this to them or can I do this? Uh, he could do whatever he had to do freely without money becoming an issue uh, 
in in the midst of whether he corrected them, whether he was uh, bringing any kind of teaching, whatever he could do, he could do it in freedom, without any fear, without any uh, worry of losing support from them. And so uh, from the perspective of motivation, from the perspective of uh, his own heart in this, uh, because money was out of the picture, it was a very, um, uh, he could be seen as someone who could be trusted, basically. Uh, we see um, here that uh, he was receiving support from other churches. So he was willing to receive support from other churches to do the work in Corinth, but he didn't want to take uh, support from them and work among them. Uh, work uh, and support uh, support from them and while he was working among them so he is taking support from them for the jerusalem church as well but not support for himself to work with them okay so um let's see if there's anything else we need to cover i think we've covered everything here um we'll continue from verses 12 to 15. Okay, so 12 to 15, I think we already read where he's uh, talking about these apostles as um, as uh, people sent from Satan, right? So he says, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So uh, these people can pretend to be ministers of righteousness. Uh, so uh, he is not willing to start receiving financial support just because all these people are bringing it up as an issue. He says, we'll continue to work the way we've been working. That is, we'll receive support from outside. We'll work for our own uh, financial needs. But we will not take money from you as a church. Uh, that will not change. Uh, and because we are doing that, it will uh, take away the opportunity from anyone else who's boasting, uh, uh, because this is something that we can boast in, that we are serving you free of charge. So while you are looking at it as ne something negative, we are looking at it as a, a positive uh, thing that um, that we know that we are serving you, uh, sacrificing our rights uh, to receive support, and with a pure desire just to take, uh, just to see you grow in faith. And then, uh, yeah, so th verses 13 to 15, uh, he's calling them false apostles, deceitful workers uh, who are pretending to be apostles of Christ, uh, just as Satan. Uh, comes as an angel of light. Uh, these ministers come as ministers of righteousness, uh, but they will receive judgment when their due time comes, right? They will be judged according to their works. Uh, we'll go on from here, verses 16 to 21. If someone can read that for us. I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourself are wise. For you put up it with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face, to our shame I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Okay, so here Paul um, goes, uh, he starts this section on boasting about things that he has done. Uh, but he says, um, it's a foolish thing that I'm doing, uh, and I don't want to do it, but I'm doing it uh, because uh, this is this is uh, my way of supporting myself 
almost. So these people are boasting in certain things. And so I will also boast so that you will see uh, who who you can trust more. So his boasting is to uh, encourage their trust in him. And um, and then he says a few things. So he says, verse uh, 17, I do not speak according to the Lord, but I'm speaking foolishly. Uh, so I, even while I'm boasting, this is not really the way of the Lord, um, but I'm choosing this foolish way. Um, so please, like, uh, please allow me to do this because this is the way the opponents are choosing to boast. But we'll see that he chooses a very different way of boasting as we continue in uh, the next chapter. Um, so he says, seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. Um, and then he says, uh, he's quite sarcastic in this these last few verses, 19 to 21. So you are wise, so you're putting up with fools. So he's uh, not actually calling them wise, uh, but they think that they are wise in the facts that in the fact that they are entertaining these apostles who uh, are coming against Paul. And uh, then he says, you put up with bondage if someone. So these people are basically abusing their authority and abusing the church. Uh, right in verse 20, all of the things that he talks about. So you are accepting all these things willingly, uh, but we didn't choose to do all those things with you. Uh, so those people are boasting in their strength, they're boasting in their power, and they're coming and taking advantage of you. But if we go by their standard, it seems that we were too weak to do those things with you. Um, and so he says, uh, so now uh, it, they are so bold to talk about all the things that is so great about them. I will also be bold among you, and I will also talk about it. Uh, so he's doing this purely uh, with the motivation of protecting the church. It's not to boast about himself. He's using this method that the other apostles are using, but his motivation is to keep the church safe from uh, the false apostles. So some things in your notes here that talk about false apostles, it says uh, they are deceitful workers. They conceal the truth or misrepresent the truth for personal gain. Uh, they pretend to be apostles of Christ, though they are unrighteous. Uh, just like Satan uh, parades as an angel of light, they pretend to be ministers of righteousness. Uh, their end reward will be according to their works. Uh, they bring people into bondage by their false teaching. Uh, they devour or they ruin, they bring to waste the believers that they are ministering to. They take away what belongs to others by manipulation or deceit. So they exploit people. Um, they exalt themselves. So in the name of ministering, so they are saying that they are ministering the gospel, but they're actually exalting themselves. They're boasting in themselves. And uh, the last one is uh, they uh, literally bring harm to the believers. They uh, strike them. They hurt them by their words, by their conduct. So these are some things uh, to look out for in leaders who are coming in. Uh, do we see these kinds of behaviors? If this is the way they are leading, uh, then it is not the way of Christ, right? The, the way of Christ is meekness, gentleness, uh, purity of heart, right? So all the ways in which Paul has been talking about his ministry, that is the way a true minister of God should carry themselves. And uh, so we can see a stark difference between how Paul has talked about his ministry versus how these uh, these apostles, uh, so-called apostles, have been serving in the church. Uh, OK, so we just have two minutes left. Uh, maybe we'll just take an early break instead of going into the next part. Uh, and we'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.